Yeah, so as, as uh, uh, Nir said, my, my name's Brian Lester. I'm a senior quantum engineer at Atom Computing. And I will be telling you today about our, our work uh, to control individual nuclear spin qubits in an array of neutral strontium atoms. So before I jump into the, the uh, physics, uh, I'll first tell you a little bit about Atom Computing. We're a, we're a quantum computing startup uh, that was founded in uh, 2018. Uh, we're based in Berkeley, California. Uh, and as you can see uh, here on the, on the left, you know, in, in 2018, we had uh, construction going on. And so we've uh, really been building up our, our uh, first prototype system in the last uh, two years. And our goal is to build universal uh, nearest neighbor gate-based uh, quantum computer uh, with neutral atoms. And in particular, we're going to use uh, strontium-87 nuclear spin qubits. And of course, just have to say, uh, we are hiring. Uh, we have a, a nice group, uh, and I hope you'll enjoy the, the work that we're doing. Uh, so yeah, first to, to motivate a little bit, it might, might be a little redundant. I, I uh, want to say, I mean, there, there are many efforts around the world uh, towards building these types of uh, quantum computers. Uh, in particular, uh, some of the larger companies, uh, IBM, Google, and Honeywell, uh, are focused on, on these gate-based uh, universal quantum computers where you have individual qubits uh, and can define gates on each one, uh, as well as entangling gates. This is all to say, uh, uh, you know, at IBM and Google, they're using superinducting circuits. At Honeywell, they're using uh, trapped ions. But, but there are many approaches, and they all have sort of common goals. Uh, and in particular, that is, we need to have a, a scalable qubit design and, and construction, so the ability to, to scale to larger and larger system sizes. Uh, and you very much need high-quality individual qubits. And then you need to demonstrate a universal gate set for, for all of your atoms, or, or sorry, all of your qubits. And so the, the question uh, you might have is, well, there's, there's a lot of in, um, investment in these other platforms. Why uh, should we use neutral atoms? And you know, I think the, the three previous talks were demonstrating exactly what I'm going to tell you next, but, but there is a fantastic amount of control and uh, interaction that has, has been demonstrated over the last uh, couple of decades. And sort of highlighting on these three, three points uh, as far as, you know, scalable construction and qubit design, uh, uh, the, the high quality individual qubits and, and tunable interactions. Um, neutral atoms, uh, as has been demonstrated, uh, can, can have nearly arbitrary uh, trap geometries. Um, as has been demonstrated with using microscope objectives to, to project trap arrays and using holography, which I'll come back to. Um, and the, the quality of the qubits, as can be demonstrated from, from Adam's talk previously, uh, there's, there's a very high efficiency readout. Uh, the readout can be performed many times before you lose the atoms. And importantly, the, the coherence time is, uh, can be quite long, uh, the second scale, uh, which is significantly longer than, than um, at least uh, superconducting circuit platforms. Um, additionally, the, uh, there's a lot of excitement uh, around uh, these Rydberg mediated interactions, which will allow for nearest neighbor uh, gates that are quite fast because of the strength of these interactions. Um, and and I, I just want to emphasize that the, the work I'm going to talk about now is really focused on, on uh, bringing these techniques that have been demonstrated uh, throughout academia and trying to adapt them for a gate-based approach to quantum computing with neutral atoms um, so that we can uh, adopt also some of the techniques that are developed in these other platforms for superconducting circuits, for trapped ions, uh, which will, we, we believe will help us you know, scale up and continue to improve uh, a quantum computing pl platform beyond just the gains that neutral atoms have over, over other platforms. Uh, so yeah, just to, to highlight also, uh, I'm going to focus on the first two points. I'm not going to be talking about um, our implementations of two qubit gates, but uh, I will highlight that you know the work shown in, in all of the pre three previous talks using Rydberg interactions uh, shows great promise. And in particular, there there are demonstrations of gates out there um, that that have very high fidelity. So it's it's very exciting. Okay, so uh, connecting to the the previous talk, uh, we are focusing on these alkaline earth-like atoms, uh, for, which is to say we, we want to have 
two valence electrons, or we're working with atoms that have two valence electrons because of the rich level structure uh, that it provides. And in particular, the variety of time scales and laser line widths that are available uh, to manipulate the atom. And, and once we define a qubit to, to uh, manipulate the qubit and, and shelve the qubit for readout. Um, and so just to, to highlight quickly, uh, this is a level structure that I specifically drawn for strontium-88, but they, they look uh, very similar for strontium-87. Uh, we have a very strong blue transition uh, that, that has a, a very um, short lifetime. So we can, we can do initial cooling and trapping of the atom along this transition. Uh, we can also use this for imaging. And then there is a variety of, of transitions to the uh, triplet P, 0, 1, and 2 uh, states that are, are useful for a variety of reasons. The, the narrow line width triple P1 transition is useful for cooling, as, as Adam mentioned uh, in his talk. And uh, the, the clock, so-called clock transition uh, on the triple P0 state uh, is, is useful for shelving. And I'll come back to, to both of those in, in a few slides. Uh, I also want to just, the last thing I'm going to say about uh, going towards two qubit interactions is that there are uh, having two valence electrons allows us to have trappable Rydberg states, meaning that um, in, in much of the previous, in, in many previous works uh, with alkali atoms, um, the, the Rydberg state was not trapped and therefore you had to shut off the, the trapping potential uh, when exciting and turning on these interactions. So the, the now for performing uh, quantum computing, we have decided to use strontium-87 because it takes this same level structure uh, but adds a nuclear spin component, which means that each of these lines has uh, a number of sublevels. In particular, the ground state has 10 sublevels. Uh, similarly, the clock state has 10, 10 sublevels. Um, and we can define our qubit as nuclear spin states, which uh, from the perspective of quantum computing is very nice because the uh, first of all, the nuclear spin levels are already quite decoupled from external magnetic fields or other, other fields. Um, and more importantly, by having them in the same manifold, a lot of the interactions that do exist with external fields are common mode. Okay. So now I'll, 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 now that I've introduced the atom we're using, let me tell you how we are constructing our array of, of qubits. So as, and I'll try to go relatively fast through this because it was already spoken about by uh, Professor Broes and, and uh, in Adam's talk as well. Um, and yeah, we're, we're also using optical tweezers, which is to say, if you uh, set up your, your system uh, well, your, or if you set up your, we, we set up our system in such a way that uh, the atoms are attracted to the point of highest intensity uh, for optical tweezers. And I think this touches on a question that came up in the chat is that uh, when you just focus a laser down to a very tight spot, uh, you actually inherently get a uh, intensity gradient in all three directions. So you get three-dimensional trapping of single atoms. Um, and what's nice about uh, optical tweezers is then you can overlap a pre-cooled gas or cloud of atoms, as, as was discussed in previous talks, uh, with these traps. And then by performing cooling, uh, what ends up happening is a, a process known as the collisional blockade where pairs of atoms get kicked out and you end up with either zero or one atoms in, in each trap. And this is a good way to isolate a single atom uh, with something like 50% efficiency. So once we have atoms in traps, we, uh, for, well, once we have atoms in one trap, we would like to, to have more atoms, uh, as has been discussed in previous talks. Uh, and what's nice about just making a single tight focus is all you have to do is add more beams to make more traps. Uh, and if you put them in at slightly different angles, they focus to different positions in, uh, in our vacuum chamber. And we don't have to define them by actually physically making separate beams. We can use holography, as was talked about in uh, Antoine's talk and Adam's talk. Uh, and we can use a spatial light modulator or, or a DMD, as uh, uh, Manuel uh, talked about in his talk, uh, where we can um, imprint a hologram uh, by, in, in our case, with a spatial light modulator, we uh, can just put a phase mask onto the spatial light modulator. And this corresponds to making uh, different traps in the atom plane. 
So this is a simple phase mask. It makes three, three traps, and I'm borrowing images from uh, the Broways lab. Uh, and what's, what's uh, great is that because it is just the Fourier transform of the phase mask, we can make these nearly arbitrarily complex patterns. So we can go into three dimensions. We can make uh, very complex patterns. Um, and it easily scales to hundreds of traps. So uh, I, in, uh, at Atom Computing, we're focusing our initial efforts on just a 2D array of atoms. So I don't want to confuse you by saying we're, we're also doing three dimensions. But, um, but it is, in principle, possible to also scale to the third dimension. Um, and by starting with hundreds of traps, that, that means that we can load hundreds of qubits. OK, so once, once you have atoms in your traps, you need to be able to detect them. Uh, and as is mentioned, uh, we can turn on a probe beam that is resonant with this very broad transition. Uh, the lifetime of that excited state is, is nanoseconds. Uh, and uh, we'll collect the fluorescence, the, the photons that are emitted from the atom, uh, with the same objective we use to cr create these traps. And this fluorescence we can then image onto uh, uh, just a standard uh, scientific CMOS camera. And when you average over many iterations of the experiment, you can see all of the traps we create. So this, is, this current iteration was a 10 by 10 trap array. Um, but in reality, as I mentioned, the, there is the collisional blockade. So each repetition of the experiment is roughly 50% filled. Uh, so these are single iterations of an experiment. And what we're seeing is which sites have atoms in them. Now, this is great. This allows us to tell how many, uh, see all of the atoms that are in the uh, singlet S not manifold um, because this transition is so broad that we don't actually resolve the, the uh, ground, the, the uh, nuclear spin states in strontium 87. But I do want to explicitly remind you that, that we are using strontium 87, so these are separate states. And importantly, because we actually want to encode our qubits in these uh, sub levels, uh, we need to have a way to. Uh, to actually detect whether it's in one of these sublevels or the other. And uh, connecting back to Adam's talk, uh, where he, he was building, doing very nice um, metrology of the, the uh, clock transition, uh, we can actually use that uh, transition to shelve our atoms. Because once the, the atoms are in the uh, triple P0 manifold, they do not fluoresce uh, when, when illuminated by the same blue light. So then we can infer the state, uh, which, which sublevel we are in based on the fluorescence from the atom. And so what I'm showing here is an experiment where we are uh, tuning our clock laser, uh, changing the frequency across these sublevels. Um, and we have already prepared, I, I should say that we prepared all the atoms in this stretch state. So the, the minus nine half state, which I'm, I'm labeling the, the ground state of our qubit. And so, when we scan this frequency, we can shelve those atoms, and then there's no more fluorescence uh, when, we're, when the atom is shelved. Now, this, this doesn't have full contrast, and that's, it's related to all of the technical details of using a clock transition. But one thing I also want to highlight uh, in contrast to strontium-88 is that with 87, uh, it's a lot easier to make uh, much faster transitions to the clock state. You can see just from the width of this that uh, this pulse is on the order of a millisecond. Uh, because it has a line width that's, that's on the order of kilohertz. And, and this is limited by the, the pulse length. It's um, Fourier limited spectroscopy. And this, this technique of using shelving to detect the quantum state uh, is, is uh, a standard technique in atomic physics and um, in particular with, with trapped ion experiments is very, very common as well. Okay, so, so this now is our, is our state detection. So I, I sort of circling back to the original uh, statement for, for quantum computation, and in particular for universal single qubit control, uh, we need to be able to read out the state of our qubit. So that's step one. And this, this is our, our way to do that. So let me redraw this level diagram a little bit uh, to highlight that our, our qubit states are this uh, minus 9 half state and the minus 7 half state. Uh, and now I need to tell you how we're going to manipulate the, uh, the state of our qubit. So I'll go ahead and draw a block sphere. Uh, this is a representation of the two-level system. So I am defining now this two-level system. Um, and we'll, we'll always initially prepare the atom in the minus 9 half state. But in order to, to have our universal single qubit control, 
we need to be able to do arbitrary rotations on this block sphere. And we're doing this by performing two photon Raman transitions rather than directly attempting to directly drive between these two qubit states as their, their splitting is very small. I uh, forgot to mention it's on the order of, uh, you know, it can be less than a kilohertz uh, and can go in, if you go to very high magnetic fields can be hundreds of kilohertz. Um, and this two photon transition is driven by having two separate beams uh, with different polarizations, but uh, that's a, a technical detail. And by adjusting the relative frequency of these two beams such that we have a frequency matching condition where the difference in those fr that frequency is equal to the qubit frequency. Uh, now, for some of the experts in the audience, you might be wondering, okay, if you have this two photon transition, what's stopping you from hopping up to the next level? And that's a very good question. Uh, you, you wouldn't be stopped from doing that. So here is a simulation showing that if I drive uh, just this two photon transition uh, without doing anything else, uh, we would expect that the population, and sorry, this is starting in the nine half state, the nine half state decreases, the seven half state first increases and decreases, but then the, the population continues walking up this ladder. So this is just highlighting the need for us to isolate our qubit manifold, which we can do by applying a global laser to the entire array, uh, which is just applying an AC start shift to the minus five halves level. And this, this then closes the transition. So we, unless the Robbie rate of this two photon transition is larger than the start shift, where the start shift can be on the order of megahertz uh, due to the, the level we're using. Um, we, we will now oscillate coherently between just the two qubit states. And this is now a simulation, uh, including the whole ground state manifold and including now the start shifting beam instead of just the two photon drive. Okay, so, so now I've told you how we're going to drive the qubit. Um, but how do we get the beams into uh, the atomic array? So uh, for driving our qubits, I guess I, I should also step back and say, we want to be able to drive each qubit individually. We don't want to do a global drive of single qubit rotations across the array. And so we can, we can borrow the same technique that has in the past been used for creating traps um, and and, and also for, for applying start chips locally to individual atoms of using what's called a, a crossed AOD setup, uh, where you have uh, an acoustic optic deflector, where you can think of a, an acoustic optic deflector takes in a beam, there's an RF frequency, and then based on the frequency of that RF, the output angle of the beam is changed, which corresponds to pointing to a different location in space. And I'm trying to indicate that here by these arrows. So we have two frequencies because of the two crossed AODs, and that allows us to point to different spots in the array. And you can think of uh, a pair of frequencies being an XY position in the atom array. And if you, this, this changes this beam pointing problem from an optical problem uh, to an RF control problem. And now this is where we can start to borrow from superconducting circuit work uh, and use agile RF synthesizers to create mini spots um, and so I've, I've replaced our logo in the upper corner with a, a animated GIF that is showing that we can arb, uh, sort of uh, paint a pattern of these spots using crossed AODs onto our atom array. And for a little bit more detail, I won't, I won't go into it too much. Uh, so I, what I've told you so far tells us how to point a single beam, uh, but we need to actually point two separate beams. And the, uh, basically we will split our light into two paths, have each one go through a pair of crossed AODs, and then get recombined before being sent to the atoms. And then the final ingredient to actually drive these transitions is to have another element that allows us to tune the relative frequency of these two beams. And we choose to use EOMs because they are, they are which is a, a phase modulator, which puts sidebands on the, on the beam, because it's very high bandwidth. So we can then drive these transitions very, uh, uh, with a much, higher rate than would be allowed uh, using, or use, using AODs, which have a, a slower turn on, turn off time. Okay, so now that I've done all the preliminaries, I can show you whether this works. Um, so just to remind you, here's our qubit. Here's what we're going to be doing effectively is flashing row by row uh, this operation light, and we can scan the frequency of one of the beams here. 
And what we'll see is now a resonance of our qubit uh, transition. So what I'm plotting here now is the, the probability that after we've performed a shelving pulse to, to take population out of the nine half state into the clock state, uh, what the relative probability of being in nine halves versus the seven half state will be. And so this, this is showing you our, our qubit drive uh, resonance. Um, a couple of things to note, we, I, I, the, the x-axis, I apologize, is offset by 6.2 kilohertz. So uh, having the two beams be at the same frequency really occurs here. Um, and this is okay because these are uh, nuclear spins. And so the actual frequency uh, difference between them doesn't, doesn't actually matter too much. We, we make the beams far off resonant before uh, we turn on the EO impulses and then um, we, can, we can control the, the qubit frequency drive. Okay, uh, so the next step, of course, is to set at uh, resonance of uh, this qubit and drive as a function of time. And this is just a, a standard Robbie protocol. Uh, we'll use, do the same thing where we're pulsing the spots row by row. Um, and this is now you can, you can get a sense for how fast our transitions are. Um, and I'll, I'll say that you know, the this, this speed of this transition can go much higher. Um, but it is a balancing of the power in our start shifting beam. So how well closed our qubit transition is versus how fast we can drive this transition. Um, and yeah, upgrades in the future will allow us to go, go even faster. Okay, so this is our, our first uh, signals of coherent oscillations between our nuclear spin qubits. And I will claim uh, and try to show in the next few slides that now we're doing this site by site. So every single site is being uh, independently driven. Uh, but this, this data that I'm showing you is averaged over the entire array, which uh, could partially account for, for some of the um, loss of contrast in this, in this signal. Uh, but future work will, will have to be done to, to confirm that. Uh, and then I just want to also show that, yeah, we, we can actually individually turn on these beams. So this is uh, just because it was the, the data set I had that had a, an X pattern in it. Um, I'm, I'm taking a qubit frequency scan where I can actually show uh, that I'm choosing not to drive five of the sites in this array, and in in this currently is a five by five array in this case. Um, great. Okay, so uh, in my remaining time, I want to uh, talk about how we've, we've now shown that we can drive it, but uh, the next logical question is what, what is the uh, qubit coherence? And, Related to that, I need to tell you, uh, prove to you that, that we actually can control the relative phase uh, arbitrarily so that we can get two like full rotations in this uh, block sphere. Okay, so uh, the, the question that could come up is, is how do you measure the qubit coherence? And first, we're going to take an atom that, that starts in the nine half state, put it in a superposition state, uh, which is to say perform a pi over two rotation uh, along some axis and to put it into an equal superposition of seven halves and nine halves. Uh, let it evolve for some amount of time. Um, and in our case, we'll actually perform an echo uh, pulse so that we're really probing the um, coherence of the atoms and not, not the relative coherence between our, our atoms and our lasers. And then uh, check whether the superposition is still coherent at the end of this by uh, performing a final pi over two pulse where we actually choose the phase of this pulse in order to see coherent oscillations rather than just an exponential decay of coherence, which aids in the, the fitting. And I will claim that this, this final pulse is what's gonna prove to you that we actually do have full phase control over our qubit operation and allows us to, to see uh, this coherence. Okay, so this is, this three pulse sequence is called a, a Ramsey echo experiment and it allows us to measure uh, T2. Uh, sometimes you, this would be referred to as T2 echo um, but this is in contrast to a, a T2 star measurement. And what I'll say is we're, we're choosing an artificial detuning of 50 Hertz uh, just to improve the fit reliability and to allow us to go out to very long time scales without taking uh, a huge amount of data. And just to say it again, the, the phase of this uh, final pulse is actuated by applying phase to one of the AODs in one of the beams. Um, yeah, on the, on the final pulse, which is what, what is demonstrating the local phase control. And so this, this is already a uh, plot showing 
these Ramsey fringes. It's uh, preliminary data, so I'll <laughs> put that out there. Um, showing the, the decay uh, that is greater than 250 milliseconds. Uh, and so this, this is oscillating at, at 50 hertz as fit by the, the sine wave. And the decay constant uh, in this particular qubit is 270. Uh, I, will, I have some, some additional plots in, in backup slides, but um, the, yeah, the, there's some technical details why I didn't show an average plot here. Uh, but the, the, the decay constants across the array were all greater than 250 milliseconds. Okay, so the, the next steps uh, for really putting this together into a quantum computer that is, is usable uh, is, first of all, we need to finish uh, improving and then characterizing our single qubit gates. So we're, we're using the system to improve the system, I like to say, uh, which is to say we're, we're using these type of Ramsey experiments to really track down sources of noise uh, and, and uh, address them. Uh, and then the, there is, of course, currently work going on to try and characterize fidelity of these operations and, and really turn it into what you would call full single qubit gates. Uh, the other point that, that was um, mentioned, at least in, in a few of these talks, is the ability to, um, to implement rearrangement for state preparation of the array. So uh, the initial loading is, is, has about 50% filling, but then we want to be able to actually drag atoms around uh, to create a, U, a fully filled array that we can then perform uh, computation on. And so this, this image here is actually, um, I, I can go into more detail if someone wants to ask the question, but, but this is a single atom that we are dragging around while we're taking an image in real time, or while we're taking a series of images. Um, and so the, the, the image processing here is taking all of those images and averaging them so that we can spell out atom computing. And finally, the, the final ingredient for actually uh, performing uh, universal computation would be uh, to perform two qubit gates. And there have been demonstrations of this in, uh, in the Lucan group and the Andres group um, that, that have very high above 99% fidelities for two qubit operations. And uh, I'll just say that the installation of our two qubit optics is underway. So, so please you know, stay tuned uh, for more information on that. Uh, and then finally, I just want to say, I hope I've uh, convinced you that we are uh, successfully trapping, detecting, and reading out uh, single strontium-87 atoms. Um, and we're, in effect, making, accidentally making a, a atomic clock in order to do our readout of our nuclear spin qubits. Um, we have translated our uh, two-photon transition, our, our um, qubit operations, into sort of an RF-controlled uh, gate scheme, which allows us to borrow on technologies developed in other uh, superinduct or uh, other quantum computing platforms. Um, and I just want to highlight that our, our Robbie rates currently are in the two to five kilohertz regime, which means that we can do gates in about a hundred microseconds. Uh, and our, our coherence times are about, are already greater than 250 milliseconds before uh, some of the in progress upgrades. And we're pushing both of these uh, in different directions so that we can have faster gates and longer coherence times, uh, which will allow us to do more gates before the atoms can cohere. And yeah, th this is all related to performing uh, qubit operations. Uh, and of course, I want to thank the entire team uh, at Atom Computing uh, and our funding uh, agencies. And uh, please, uh, are there any questions? Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope the picture was taken before the corona. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, sorry. This is a, a little bit outdated photo. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I'll ask one question. So can you very briefly comment what limits the coherence time currently and what limits the gate fidelity or the Rabi frequency high pulse fidelity and how can you improve it? Absolutely. So uh, primarily the, the coherence time we believe is limited by uh, our residual magnetic field fluctuations. So um, the, the yeah, th this is something. This is a technical detail. Uh, we had a, a first round of our, our magnetic field servo, and that's the that's currently the primary limiting factor. Um, the the coherence time should be should be seconds uh, once we have that fixed. Um, additionally, the Rabi rates, as I mentioned, I, I actually uh, with our current setup have driven Rabi rates that are uh, upwards of 10 kilohertz. 
Um, but that uh, once we get to that level of power, our Stark shift beam is is no longer keeping a closed uh, qubit system. Uh, so so it's really a matter of increasing the beam power for for the Stark shifting beam and allowing us to keep a, a, a closed qubits manifold. Okay, thank you very much.